Today we're going to con conclude our uh, message or our study on Second Chronicles 7.14. Um, for those of you that have missed one or two, um, it's again a time for repentance. How many you know that we serve a covenant God? Amen. He is a God of covenant. Uh, he loves his people. He loves those that are his. He loves, you know, he loves us. How many know that repentance is not just a mere I'm sorry, right? It's, we learned from uh, last month that, uh, you know, when it comes to repentance, uh, it's not just an, uh, an I'm sorry. Uh, this, you know, this is, and we learned that this is known a, uh, as a worldly sorrow and not a godly sorrow, um, which produces life. And Second Corinthians, brother, if you turn your Bibles there, Second Corinthians 7.10 we learned that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. You know, we see, we see two different hearts, brothers. We see two different hearts. And that's what, the God, that's what our Lord is seeking. You know, he's seeking uh, true worshipers that will worship him in spirit and in truth, right? So we learned that godly sorrow, right? Sorrow that is produced by the Holy Spirit. Will, will bring you closer to God, will, will cleanse you. Whereas uh, worldly sorrow, you know, just saying I'm sorry, not mean, you know, meaning it maybe from the mind but not the heart, that produces death in our life. Out of Psalm, uh, Psalms 51, 17, the word of God declares that um, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise you know, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Remember last month when we talked about the Pharisee and the tax collector? There's two different men right there, two different hearts. You know, one, we talked about how one of them, or both of them actually came to the altar. One of them um, was basically telling God everything he had done. You know, Lord, I, I give not only a tenth, I give more than a tenth. You know, I, I pray you know, you, you ask for twice a week. I pray, you know, however, five times more. I mean, you know, I do this and I do that. Whereas the tax collector, he couldn't even look up to heaven. You know, he was, there was such a burden in his heart that he couldn't even look up and say, Lord, forgive me, Lord, you know. And we know that by uh, Jesus speaking this, um, we, we see which one was, you know, forgiven. Which one went home justified? And it wasn't a Pharisee. It was a tax collector. Because it's all about the heart, you know. Uh, it's all about the heart, and, 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 and God honors a surrendered heart. You know, he, he despised the pride, he, the proud. He despises the proud, uh, you know, which is from the flesh. You know, humility, humbleness, it comes from the spirit, brothers. Repentance describes the very act of coming to God. Uh, you cannot turn towards God without turning from the things he is against. Uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, said this, People seem to jump into faith very quickly nowadays. I do not disapprove that happy leap, but still, I hope my old friend, repentance, is not dead. I am desperately in love with repentance. It seems to me to be the twin sister to faith. Now again, this is Charles Spurgeon. You know, a lot of people think, and, and we, we've gone through this in, in past lessons, but I'm going to mention it again because I think it's very important, you know. Uh, a lot of people believe that repentance is just done at the initial uh, confession, right, of your faith. It, it, you know, the initial, uh, when, you, when you confess the Lord as your Savior. You know, a lot of people think that's just a one-time occurrence. But how I many you know that repentance is a, should be a lifestyle, should be the lifestyle of a Christian. Uh, you know, when you learn the true uh, meaning of, of repentance and what really it really is, uh, that should be our frame of mind. You know, and, and as we continue, you'll see what I'm talking about. You know, repentance, brothers, is a change of mind in both thinking and action. You know, I love this Psalms right here. Psalms 119.59. 119.59 says, I... I thought on my ways. This is a psalmist saying, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. What is he saying? I thought on my ways. You know, I thought about 
the way I'm living. I thought about my actions. You know, I thought about my sin. How I have come against your, your law. How I have come against your, your word, Lord. You know, I, I, I examined my heart. I examined my heart against your word. And I found it to be failing. You know, it, and, and even the word declares in the New Testament, it declares for us to examine our, our hearts, to examine our life daily. You know, this, again, this is not just that initial, at the initial salvation. This should be, you know, a, a daily occurrence. So, you know, it's, it's a relationship that we have with our Lord. We should examine our hearts. You know, it shouldn't take somebody to tell us or the pastor or the ministers. Uh, we, if we have that relationship with the Lord, we're going to be examining our hearts. What pleases him and what doesn't. And so that's, this is what the psalmist is doing, brothers. He's examining his heart and he's saying, Lord, if you find something in me that does not please you, remove it from me. Notice what he says. He says, hey, I, I thought on my ways. You know, I... I I didn't just keep on living or going uh, through my daily life just, you know, like, like every day. You know, I actually, I, I meditated. I, I, I thought about it. And, I, and then, you know, once I realized, once I realized that there was sin in my life or that, you know, there, there's an area where I'm failing you, what does he do? He turned his feet. He turned unto God's word, unto God's testimonies. He aligned himself to the will of God. Amen? What does, who does that remind you of? Who was living in the mud, eating pig's food, and at his, he realized where he was at his lowest point? He realized, you know what? What am I doing here? This is not me. This is not who God has called me to be. You know? Does, does that not remind you of the prodigal son? You know, it, it was at his lowest point that he realized where he was and where he had ended up because of his choice. I mean, let's be honest. How many of us realize that we needed God when we were at our, our lowest point? Amen? If it wasn't, for these, for tragedies, if it wasn't for 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 incidents, you know, uh, hard incidents in our in our life, honestly, the majority of us, if I, I'm, I dare to say, all of us would not seek God. Even as Christians, you know, sometimes we have to go through hard times because if not, we just take the relationship between us and our Lord for granted. Amen. It's kind of like even our, our marriage, our relationships with others, we take them for granted. You know, uh, I, and, and it ha it's happened to all of us. I mean, for those of you that have been married uh, for a while, you know, more than 10 years, you realize, you know. You know, I've been married with my wife uh, going on uh, 27 years, and, and I realize, you know what? I have to work at my marriage. I have to work at my marriage. I cannot take my marriage for granted. You know, uh, and, and sorry to say, sisters, but men, we, t we, t we tend to do that. Uh, we tend to be comfortable, and, and when we get comfortable, you know, we get, you know, it's, it's a casual relationship. It's, it turns into a casual relationship. You know, it gets stagnant because we're comfortable. And you, you might say, well, Brother David, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with being casual? You know, what's, what's wrong with being relaxed? With, why do we have to walk on eggshells? You see, that's the other side. That's what the enemy wants. The enemy wants you to walk on eggshells, not only with each other, but with him. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't want my friends or my brothers and sisters to walk around, you know, on eggshells. I don't want my spouse to walk on eggshells around me. You know, that's horrible. I want you to love me for who I am. You know, and, and that's what the Lord is asking of us. Remember the beginning I said he is a covenant God. You know, he takes his covenant uh, serious. I mean, to the point where, you know what, he compares our relationship to him between a man and a wife. Aren't we his bride? We are the bride of Christ. You know, what does that mean? There's that covenant. But there's that love, that agape love. 
that we in the flesh cannot understand and will not understand. It's only in the spirit that we realize what agape love is. And you know, you want to see what agape love is? Look at the cross. He loved us when we, we didn't love him. Amen? He called us when we were in the mud. He called you at your lowest point. He invited you to become his at your lowest point. Not at your, not at your highest point, right? He invited you when? When you were at your lowest point. Doesn't that declare love? You know, it's like we've been, we've been man- mentioning Hosea, right? We've been mentioning uh, his wife, how, how he, he bought her and he called her back. Uh, Gomor, uh, Gomer, that's her name, at, her, at the lowest point. This lady was a prostitute. This lady had been, you know, going from man to man. This lady, you know what? She was at the point where she was a slave and she had been sold to the slave market. And that's when Hosea went and got his wife back at her lowest point. If that's not true love, I don't know what is. Any other man would have said, forget her. She doesn't love me. She loves every other man but me. You know what? Forget her. But no, that lady already belonged to Hosea. That lady already, already, she was already his. He didn't have to buy her back. But he did. Because he loved her. Well, brothers and sisters, that's what Christ did for us. He bought us with a price. He bought us back when we were at our lowest point. He bought us back. He didn't have to. He didn't have to leave the side of the Father. He chose to lay down the crown for a cross. And that should motivate us every day to live a life of repentance. Not not out of the law. Not out of, you know what, uh, legalism. Out of love, brothers. Why do we not offend our spouse? Why do we choose not to offend our spouse? By seeking other people. Well, first of all, I don't want to seek anybody else because I love my wife. Right? Out of love. So that's what the psalmist is saying here. He's saying, listen, I thought about my ways, man. I thought about them and how horrible am I living? You know, I'm living contrary to to, to the word of God. I'm living out of my father's will. I'm living away from a father's will. I failed them. So I'm turning back. I'm turning back to his word, to his statutes, to his commandments. Not out of legalism, but because I love him. And I want to keep his ways in everything that I do. Not just on Sundays, not just be, you know, when I'm going to minister. Every day of our lives. As a father, as a wife, as a spouse, as, you know, as a worker. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's what he's calling us. Again, I tell you, and I remind you, brothers, God is a covenant God. And he's calling you back to the covenant. He's calling you back to be his. But brother, I already gave my life to to Christ. Yes, but we keep taking it back, brothers and sisters. By our actions, by our thoughts, we keep taking it back. Leave it at the altar. Give him your heart. Don't worry about everything else that's going on in your life. He will take care of it. Your job is just to surrender all. Surrender your will. Surrender your heart. When you surrender your heart, God has everything. Your problems are not your problems. Your problems become his. But the enemy, he's very strategic. He loves to to fog your brain, to fog your mind with with problems and, and, and and religion and you name it. God is very simple. I'm calling my bride back because I love her. And I want to cleanse her. I want to make her mine. You know, I mean, you know that repentance is a gift of God. It is by grace, brothers and sisters. It's a gift of God. When he called us, when he called you, that was a gift for you, to you. You, again, I I remind you, and I know you've heard this before, uh, many times before, but you did not choose Jesus. He chose you. 
He called you. He appointed you. He anointed you to be His. The word, the word declares that He gives us the power to become His children, to be His children. This is not of the flesh. This is weak. My mind, I cannot say one day, you know what? I want to be a child of God. I'm going to become, you know what? I'm going to go buy a sport jacket so I can become a child of God. Doesn't work that way. And you make, yeah, I mean, doesn't work that way, brothers and sisters. You know, it, it, isn't it beautiful that, thank God it doesn't work that way. It's on behalf of him. He called us. He cleanses us. He anoints us to walk in his ways and to keep his ways. You see that? The Ezekiel, the promise of Ezekiel is fulfilled. He gives us that new heart. You know what the problem is? A lot of times, uh, and, and I've seen this, where people come to the altar and, and they say a prayer and, 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 and they, they believe, honestly, they believe that they gave their heart to the Lord, but then they take it back. And as soon as they leave this, this building, they forget about what they just did. You know, they made a decision of the mind and not of the heart. You know, I don't know about you, but when I went to the altar and I said I do to my wife, I meant it. Can you imagine me, you know, uh, well, you know what? I don't want to be married to her today. And we do that without Christ. We do that. Right? We do that to our spouse. We do that to him. It is only through Christ that we were able to maintain that covenant. Not only with him, but with each other. You see that? It goes back to agape love. It's only through the, through the Holy Spirit, brothers. So, again, it's, 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 it's a gift from God. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Notice, he is patient towards you. Not wishing for some to perish. Is that what it says? It says, for any. For any to perish, but for all, right? Not just for some, for the selected few. No, for all to come to repentance. That's God's heart right there. You know why he tarries? You know why he has not come yet for his church, for his, his people? Because he's waiting patiently. You know, it's kind of like us and our, our kids, right? You know, we can't wait for that next stage, but again, we're, we're, we're still like, no, but, but I don't want him to grow up, you know? Not yet, not yet. But we know when they're ready. We know when they're, we're, they're ready for that next stage. You know, and, and we encourage them, and we wait patiently because if we push them too hard, it might be premature, and we're going to end up hurting them, right? Well, that's what, kind, that's what our Lord does with us. He waits patiently. He knows the, the right time. He knows the perfect time. You know that Jesus came at the perfect time. And this blows my mind because notice he could have came before the Roman Empire. Very, but everything had to be set in place. You know, ro the Roman Empire brought roads, brothers and sisters. I mean, something as simple as that. It brought roads. You know what roads means? When the gospel went out, guess what? The roads were there. Something as simple as that. God has his mind on that. See, Jesus came at the perfect time. Jesus called you at the perfect time. You know, I always say that I thank my Lord. I thank him that, you know, because my wife and I couldn't have kids, right? We, we had been married 15 years before we ended up having our oldest one. Uh, most of you have heard that testimony. But I always praise God that they came when they came. Because I joke around it, but I mean it at the same time. And I say, you know what? I'm glad I, that God brought them at this, at this time. Because if not, I would have ruined them without Christ. Honestly, I would have ruined them. You know? If they would have came back then. But because they came now, at this time... We are a godly household. They are growing up in Christ. They are growing up in the ways of the Lord. Instead of the ways of the devil. Or instead of the ways of the world. 
right? So I, I praise God for that. You know, I praise God, but, but God has his timing, brothers. Just remember that all, thing, all good gifts are from above, brothers. All good gifts. The physical gifts and the spiritual gifts. Everything comes from God. Again, even repentance. Acts 5.31, first it came for Israel. Acts 5.31 says, He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Notice that. Jesus came to his, first, to his own first, to his own people. people uh, our Lord came to the Jews. He offered salvation to them. They rejected it. As a nation, they rejected Yeshua. They rejected Jesus, right? Now, God is not through with them. A lot of people think that God is through with them. There's coming a time when the nation of Israel is, will repent of their sins and will come to the Lord Yeshua as a nation. There's coming a time, brothers, soon. However, you know what that did when they rejected the Messiah as a nation? Acts eleven eighteen. It opened up the doors to the Gentiles, right? All of us, that's us, right? When they heard this, they quit it down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Notice that. Again, there's two types of repentance. Repentance, uh, godly repentance that leads to life, right? Because it's of the spirit. Or worldly repentance, worldly sorrow, right? Uh, just to the mind, just to, oh, I'm sorry, that leads to death. Because life, there's no life in it. And if there's no life in it, it's dead. It's dead works. It's religion, Right? That's why religion stinks, because it's dead works. It's not going anywhere. So remember that, brothers. We are blessed because we have been offered repentance. We are offered repentance as a gift. It's a gift of God. And remember what repentance is. It's turning away from your sins, right? Turning away, uh, change of mind, right? Just like the prodigal son did. Hey, you know what? I'm in the mud eating food with pigs. You know what? Forget this, man. My father has a castle. My father has the best you know, uh, 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 tamales in the world, you know what? I'm going to go over there, right? I'm going to go over there. <laughs> so it's a change of mind. I used to be this, but I no longer want to be this. I want to be yours, Lord, right? I used to be a drunk. I'm no longer a drunk. Lord, I want to live for you. I want to be yours, Father God. It's a change of mind, Right? When, but when you sense the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart, that's the time to strike. That's the time to, to surrender all. So, it is only a humble heart that will receive God's mercy and grace for repentance. As we learned, a proud, proudful heart will not. Through God's word, a heart is either prepared for heaven or for hell. Grace or judgment, brothers and sisters. You know what? The word of God is active. It's alive. It, it's like a double-edged sword. It will divide down. You know, it will either prepare the people for repentance, right? Or for judgment. A hard heart, right? That hears the word of God gets harder. Just like Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh? He heard the word of the Lord. He didn't repent. It just made the heart harder. So notice even Judas, he didn't repent. His was a godly sorrow, I mean, I'm sorry, a worldly sorrow, right? He was sorry from the mind, I mean, to the point where he hung himself. But he didn't repent. He didn't turn from that like Peter did. Remember when Peter even cussed and denied the Lord? Remember that? He repented that. He, he, he turned from that and said, Lord, I'm yours. As I was mentioning, you know, the word of God either prepares you for repentance or judgment. Isaiah 58, 1. That's where I wanted to go. Isaiah 58, 1 says, Cry out loud, spare not, lift your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say? And you have not seen. Why have we afflicted our souls? And you take no notice. Look, look at the pride in that. 
Look at the pride of, of, of that nation saying, man, we, we, hey, we give our tithes. We go to church. Lord, I go to church. I go to church on Wednesdays, Sundays, and, and I even go to the pastor's house. Why haven't you answered my prayer? I give my tithes. I, man, I do every, I do side straight on hops. You know, that's jumping jacks. Uh, I do religious jumping jacks. Why have you not answered my prayer? I mean, I, I've heard sermons, brothers and sisters, where, where the, the pastor will tell the congregation, you declare to the Lord and you tell him and you bring up his word and, and, and you know, and, and basically, I mean, you, you boast to him and you tell him. I mean, you demand it. That's the word I was looking for. You demand it from him. No, you don't demand anything from God. You don't demand nothing from God. We seek his heart. We seek his will. We seek his face because our prayer should be aligning up to his will anyway. So our prayer should be his thoughts already. You see, remember what the word declares. You know, when we pray, if, and I'm going to for it, paraphrase it, if they're not being answered, it's because they're not, aligned, they're not according to his will. We're, we're praying to according to our will, according to the flesh. That's why they're not being answered. Now, don't get me wrong. God says yes, no, and wait, right? Those are the three things he says. Because, again, we go back to he knows the right time he knows the right time so our job is to wait and trust isaiah uh 40 31 wait and trust wait wait on the lord wait and that 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 doesn't mean okay i'm waiting no that means trust 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 in the lord be at peace shalom shalom in the lord amen be at peace he's got your back he's got you Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, right? Plans to prosper you, to give you hope in the future, right? Not to harm you, not for evil. He knows the plans he has for us. Yes, he knows the plans he has for Israel. He knows the plans he has for us. We're one. Amen? Now, so, right here. When was it, uh, looking back through the book of Judges and, and, and throughout the Bible, really, when was the one time when the enemy would attack the nation of Israel? And you see this over and over and over. The one time you see the enemy come into the land of Israel and attack Israel and take, you know, take everything from Israel was when they were out of God's will. And you know what? Looking back at our lives... Just look at the resemblance. When was it or when is it when the enemy comes into our life? When we're out of God's will. Now, again, we're going to go through hard times as Christians. We are going to suffer persecution. We're going to suffer things. I'm not talking about that. Okay? I'm talking about when the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy in our lives. When we give him a foothold. Right? When we give him a foothold. So God resists the proud because they're out of his will. They don't have a surrendered heart. How can he work in their life without a surrendered heart? God cannot and will not work through an unsurrendered heart. He will do, you can't even imagine what he will do with a surrendered heart. Background does not matter. Education does not matter. Race does not matter. All that matters is a surrendered heart. Amen? That's all he wants, a surrendered heart. And he will do volumes through you. You know that repentance, again, comes by a humble heart. A humble heart will move the heart of God. I love that. A humble heart will move the heart of God. James 4, again, 6 through 10, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble, gives grace to the humble. In Psalms 32, 5, the word declares, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. Notice, Psalmist David, look at, look at how, what type of relationship he had with the Lord. He didn't hide his sin. When he was confronted, he, he confessed his sin. Right? When Nathaniel came and, 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 and confronted him, he confessed it. Notice again, Psalms 32, 5. It says, 
I acknowledge my sin to you, Lord. I acknowledge it to you. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. You forgave the guilt of my sin. How you know that there is that guiltiness? You know, there's that 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 it just lingers, you know, that when we sin and, and we as Christians, I mean, it's just, you know, have you ever heard that forgiveness is not so much for the other person, that, but it's for us? When you forgive somebody, you know, because think about it. Unforgiveness comes from a proudful heart. It really, really does. When you forgive somebody, I don't care who, what, or where, you give it to the Lord. You give it to the Lord. Say, Lord, this person hurt me in my past. But, Lord, I lay it at the cross. I lay it at your feet. I let go of this. Because you know what? That unforgiveness is affecting your relationship with, between you and the Lord. Yes, I know they hurt you. I know they did. I know it hurts. I know. There's things that we would shiver at hearing if we knew what happened in your life. I know that. But he knows and that's a, you've been asking, you have been asking, what is it? Why? I feel there's something blocked. That's what's blocking it. That is what's blocking it. Let it go and watch what the Lord will do with it. You know, you heard the pastor say over and over, you know, he turns our ashes into what? Beauty. Sister, brother, let it go. That's what David did. He confessed his sins unto the Lord. That's a sin. Unforgiveness is a sin. He let it go. Nehemiah 1.6, the word says, Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. Notice, he's talking to the Lord, which I am praying before you now, day and night, which I am praying for you for 10 minutes. You know, day and night. It could be a literal day and night. But you know what this represents? An ongoing relationship. It's not just, just a short little 10 minutes here and there. It's an ongoing prayer life with the Lord. An ongoing communication with the Lord. That's what Nehemiah is talking about. Lord, I'm, I, I'm talking to you. I'm speaking to you, Father God. And not only on my behalf. Notice what he says next. But on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins. There it is again. Confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. And I, my father's house, have sinned. Notice that. He didn't just say, well, Lord, forgive Israel because they're, they're sinners, man. No. I'm included in there, Lord. We have sinned against you. And you know what? The church has sinned against Christ. I'm going to tell you right now. The church in, at large is out of God's will. Now, there's a remnant, don't get me wrong, not everybody. There's those surrendered hearts that love the Lord with all their heart and servants of the Lord that are serving Him mightily. Right? We know that. I'm not saying everybody. But us as a generation, we need to honestly repent, turn from what we thought it was, what we were thought, or, you know, the way we were going. and. You know, a lot of us have already. But again, remember, it's, it's, it's an ongoing relationship. And I remind you again of, you know, a marriage. A marriage. It's, it's work. You need to communicate as a spouse, as, as, you know, as a couple. You need to maintain that communication. Because if not, that's where the enemy comes in. Right? That's where the enemy comes in. He'll start whispering little sweet nothings to her. Oh, you see? He doesn't love you. You see? He doesn't care about you. Oh, look at that. Look. Look look at that face he made. Poor guy, man. He was, you know, probably, you know, wiping his nose and, <laughs> you know, but that's the way the enemy works. And vice versa. He whispers sweet nothings to the husbands as well. You see, she doesn't care for you no more. Ya no te hace tortillas. You know, she, like, 
like back when you were fresh, you know, I'm not serious. <laughs> I'm not throwing stones at anybody, Pastor. I'm just, you know. <laughs> but isn't it true how the enemy works, brothers? He wants his once against the other, you know, because if he has his once against the other, he has his against our Father. You see that? So, repentance, right? Comes to a, it's a gift from God. It's, it's, it's a change of mind by the Holy Spirit, right? And it's, it's, you know what? It's a gift from God. But more than that, you know, it, it, it comes through a humble heart. It cleanses us. You know, the fruit of repentance, brothers. The fruit of repentance. He honors those that honor him. You can find that in 1 Samuel. Um, he honors, God honors those that honor him. You see that time and time again. Look at the servants. Look at his servants throughout the Bible. Isaiah 58, 13 says, If you turn away from your Sabbath, I'm, yeah, your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath of delight, the holy, uh, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, and not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause, notice that, I will cause you to write on the high hills on the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, some people run with this, man. They'll, they'll run with this and they'll try to make a religion out of this, right? They'll take this literal. I mean, which at the time it, it is. But you got to understand, who is our Sabbath? Jesus. Jesus is our Sabbath. Right. In other words, the Sabbath does not control us. See that? It was never meant to be a religion. It was a foreshadow of what was coming. The Sabbath stood for the day of rest. Right? Who is our rest? Our Lord Jesus. God. Right? Our Lord Jesus. He is our rest, brother and sister. He gives us rest from our sins. He gives us rest from our iniquity. He gives us rest, you know what? From eternal death. So that's why he is our Sabbath. So we must maintain that relationship with him. So what will repentance bring? Job 33, 7, and we talked about this. I'm sorry, it's 33, 27. Notice what repentance, a change of mind, a change of heart. This is what it will bring, brothers and sisters. The word declares, he looks upon man and say, I have sinned. And perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. He will deliver his soul from going to the pit, and his life shall see the light. Notice that. The man that says, you know what? I have sinned against God. My ways were wrong. I was going down the wrong road. Lord, I changed my heart. You know what? I give you my heart. The person that says that, he delivers him from hell. That's his promise. Right? We know this. Because we were all destined to hell. All of us without Christ. And John, uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from, all, from every unrighteousness. Again, we're all born with sin. I mean, we were formed in sin. Uh, the psalmist says that I was formed in iniquity in my mother's womb. When a baby is born, he's already born in sin, brothers and sisters. Right? He's already born in sin. So, even if you were to live, try to live like the, the young ruler, he told Jesus that he had kept all, his, all the commandments. Right? He said, because he asked the Lord, how, how, basically, you know, how, how is it that I can make it to heaven? And Jesus responded by keeping the, the law. And, of course, he wanted to check his heart because he knew there was something there. And uh, the young ruler said, hey, I've kept all this. I've kept the word since my youth. He goes, okay. Go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You see, that was his God. Money was his God. So, right there, the, the, the word of God declares that if you break one law, you've broken them all. You see this. You break one You've broken them all. How many sins does it take to, to go to hell? Have you ever lied? Who hasn't, right? Have you ever stolen anything? 
and I'm going to the, back to the way of the master, but honestly, it shows our heart. You know, the word of God declares is, this is a mirror. This is a mirror, and we should examine our life against it. You know, because a lot of people think, well, I've never sinned. I've never killed anybody. Have you ever hated anybody? The word of, Jesus said that if you hate your brother, that's already killing. That's, that's murder. You know? So, again, it goes back to the, not the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. Okay? So, God is faithful, brothers. Again, he is faithful to those that are faithful. And he, he loves those that, you know, he loves his people. And there's a coming a time of, of uh, refreshing. Acts 3.19 says, repent then, turn back, so that your sins may be wiped away. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus a Christ who has appointed, who has been appointed for you. Didn't you feel that at the time of your salvation? At the time of your new birth? That time of refreshing, you felt like everything had been lifted off, right? You felt like a new person. Because you were. You are a new creation. But again, I remind you, the enemy comes to, to blind you. And to, he wants to get you back to that old position. And worse, because remember what the Word of God declares, that once the house is cleansed, if it's not maintained, you know, seven more ugly, uh, worse demons will come in. Remember that. Because we allow the enemy to come in, just like Israel did. Every time the enemy attacked, and I remind you, it was when they were out of God's will. You know, and, and I know it sounds legalistic, right? Whoa, they were out of God's will. You know what? Put it this way. They fell out of love. They were out of love. They fell out of love from loving God. Maybe they never loved them. In the beginning, from the beginning. You know, when a couple stops loving each other, they, stop, they start hurting each other, don't they? They start hurting each other. And that's when that relationship breaks. When we stop loving God, we start hurting Him by our actions, our words. And He hurts. He hurts because we are His. It's just like if... if wouldn't, if your spouse was unfaithful to you, wouldn't that hurt you? Would that hurt you? Why? Because we love our spouses, and they're ours. When we go to the world, and we do what the world does, we choose that. Guess what? We're hurting him. He hurts. He knows what's best for us. And he knows that being in his will, being in him is the best. Yeah, we're going to hurt. Yes, we're going to go through tough times. Like I mentioned, as Christians, we, are, we will suffer persecution. However, what is his promise? Do not be afraid or discouraged for I am the Lord your God and I will go with you wherever you go. I will go with you. He will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. That is his promise. Like a loving father guiding you, holding your hand through the, through the rough waters, brothers and sisters. That is our father. You are not orphans. He has not left you here without hope, without him. Remember, the Holy Spirit is not just a spirit. It's not just air. He is God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are one. So don't think of God being way out there. He's here. He's here. If you have invited him into your heart. Amen? He is here. And he's calling us back, brothers. Because again, we're the ones that have left. We're the ones that have departed from him. We're the ones that have forsaken our first love. So, repent. Come back. Turn back. So that your sins may be wiped away. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. From who? From the presence of the Lord. Peace is only found in Jesus, brothers. I don't know why we keep seeking peace everywhere else. We keep trying to, you know, seek peace with our partners, with our, you know, with our spouses, with our job, with our, you name it. 
peace is only found in Jesus. Joel 2.25. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing uh, locust. Man, that's a lot of locusts. My great army which I send among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wonder, wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God. And there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. That is the promise of the Lord. He will never forsake those that are his. Never. See, if you feel forsaken, maybe we have gone away from him. And we need to come back. We need to come. You know, what did Paul declare? Come back to your first love. You see that? Come back. Don't just make it a routine. God didn't call you for, to a routine or to a religion. He called you to a relationship. You know, maybe we have been religious in the past and we, we've never had that relationship with our Lord. It's time. Right there where you're at. You know, doesn't, there, there doesn't have to be an altar call. Right there where you're at. I mean, if there's an altar call, beautiful. Go for it. But right there where you're at, turn from that. Turn from the way you have been living from, you know, you might not be out there in the bars, but we have gone away from God here. Come back to him and he will restore. He will restore what the enemy has stolen. You see, the enemy came to what? Heal, steal, and destroy. And that's, that's not just a cliche. That's his mission. That is, that is the devil's marching orders. And he does it without respecting anybody. He's not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter if he's one-year-old or hundred-year-old. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. But God has come. Jesus has come to give us life. Life more abundantly. That doesn't mean you're going to own a BMW and have a, a castle. That's not what it's talking about. Abundant life means life in the spirit. Life full of life. Life full of Jesus. Life full of shalom. That's what he promises. Amen? That's what he promises. If we make him ours again. 